My name is Paul, I'm CPD Manager from Busy Bees Education and Training, and I'm here to talk to you about the changes to the EYFS. Now, just to give you a tiny bit of a background about me, I've worked in childcare for about 22 years. I've been really lucky. I've worked different parts of the planet doing different jobs, and I've worked for Busy Bees for the past five years in a training capacity. Now, this course is a really important one because I think um, when people hear the term change and it's linked to the curriculum and requirements for Mofsted, there's gonna be lots of worries. So what I'm gonna do over the next 40 minutes or so is hopefully ease the concerns that you have and make clear what it is you're gonna be responsible for doing when September comes around. So we're gonna be covering changes that have been made by Ofsted. We're gonna be talking about what the changes are and what they're gonna to mean to you, how it's gonna impact your inspections, and we're also gonna look at the new aspects which are linked to the seven areas of learning. But let's start with this. Why on earth would the Department for Education decide to change things when people know what it is they're doing at the moment? Well, the reasons they've made changes are because they want to improve outcomes for all children. They want to make the early learning goals clear so everyone can access them more easily. What they've actually done is reduced them down. It's actually been done quite significantly, but the aim of this is to have more focus on practitioners knowing children. I'm gonna clarify that in a short while. Want to improve literacy and numeracy outcomes. Literacy, numeracy, but also personal, social and emotional development as well. So what we want is key people and staff teams to really get to know children and provide them a rich foundation with language, numeracy, but also a really stable and strong emotional well-being. And then we want to improve language and vocabulary in children, particularly those from vulnerable backgrounds or disadvantaged backgrounds. There's been a massive um, amount of research that has shown that over the years, children from disadvantaged backgrounds have had less vocabulary than their counterparts from other classes. What this can transpire as is children who might demonstrate unwanted behaviours simply because they don't have the language to communicate their wants and needs. Now let's move this on. So the aims of the Early Years Foundation stage now are going to be quality and consistency in all the early year settings so that every child makes good progress. What we're doing now is looking at individual children. So rather than having the early years outcomes as a tick list of sorts, what we're focusing on now is key people knowing their key children. Beyond there, we wanna make sure that no child gets left behind. Again, knowing these key children, understanding what their strengths are, identifying areas for support, really looking at building on those strengths and really looking at supporting those areas for support. So here we've got the secure foundation through planning for learning and development of each individual child and assessing and reviewing what they've learned regularly. We're gonna explore that because this is going to potentially change the way that some people approach their planning of activities and opportunities for children. Partnerships between parents and carers, um, along with the practitioners. And then we're also looking at equality of opportunity and anti-discriminatory practice so that every child is included and supported. This is really linking to those British values which we have available to promote diversity, to promote children to understand other people. If British values is something that you're not that confident on, we do have a tremendously short course which discusses this, explains why we have them, but how you can implement them in your settings. Now, Julian Grenier is the person that was invo um, involved um, in making the development matters, the new ones that will be coming out in September. And he said he wanted it as a starting point for practitioners to build their own ambitious and rich curriculum to support every individual child. So in the current development matters, there's lots of bullet points of certain milestones that children should achieve through the seven areas of learning. That's been cut back quite significantly. The reason it's been cut back is because in some cases, we had practitioners that were focusing more on the bullet points and trying to get the child there rather than focusing on what the child was able to do. So beyond that, Grenier believes that it's poor practice to characterise certain children as younger than they are by applying bands to them. So what we're talking about here is when we've got the bullet points in the current development matters, 
There were some children who weren't achieving um, outcomes that matched with their age. And what Grenny is saying is, we want to sort of move away from that. We want to focus on what this child can do and focus on adults building upon these strengths. And again, identifying areas where the child needs support and apply it. So we need to respect the different development pathways that children take because all children learn differently. There are going to be some children that you work with who, if they are outside, they are golden. They can get it going, they get engaged and they are proper focused. Whereas that same child, if they're inside, you might find they're a bit more disoriented, they're a bit more flitting through activities. What we want is key people to know their key children, what works for them, what motivates them, what engages them. So learning journeys and assessments are important, but we need it to be proportionate and balanced. Paperwork that we have that exists right now is important. In September, what we're saying is, you as the practitioners and you as the centres need to make the decisions. Is this information that we're documenting beneficial? Is it benefiting us in understanding this child and meeting their needs? Is it going to benefit other practitioners that work with the child? And if the answer to either of those things isn't yes, why are we doing it? Going to move us on from there. Now, as well as the development matters being amended, there are some documents which are actually going to be removed. So if you've got any of these documents in your centres, as of September, they're going to be archived because we're not using them anymore. The early years outcomes and what to expect and when, those again, documents to be archived as we'll have new um, documentation that comes through in September. Now, what does all of that mean to you? It means we need to start right from the beginning. So when parents are coming to your centres, they're introducing your, their child to you, we want to be engaging with these parents and finding out as much information as we can about their children. So some of the things that we want to be speaking to parents about when they're having those initial visits and settling their children in, what can your child do on their own? So what skills does the child have? What do you think they need help with? What are their likes and dislikes? And what do they need support with to learn and develop? Those key questions are going to provide a foundation for you as key people and, and as centres to meet the needs of this individual child. This is also going to be tremendously important when we have our inspections, because one of the things the inspectors are going to be asking is, when this child started, where were they at? And what they're going to want to talk to you about is this child's learning journey that arrived them at this point. Now, when this comes to inspections, this is usually a time where everybody gets into a massive panic, the inspector's at the door, and it's meltdown. If you change your mindset a tiny bit and consider this, you generally put so many hours into working with these children and providing opportunities for them. When your inspection happens, it's opportunity for you to really shine. And given that the new focuses from Ofsted and the Department for Education are focused on key people knowing those key children, this is opportunity for you to show just how strong those relationships are. How are Ofsted inspectors going to identify this? They're probably going to be asking you questions like this. When the child started, this was their point. These were the things that they could do. These were the skills they had. We identified they had support that needed to be put in place in these other areas. The parents said, so when the parents were talking about the child, how did they describe it? Did they say that they were worried about their child starting nursery because they weren't around other children so much and they were worried about socialisation? Did you have parents who were concerned about language? Did you have parents who were tremendously confident and thought their child was going to do really well? But you need to identify how did you work with these parents to get to know this child. Beyond there, you want to talk about what it is you've seen from the child. The parents will tell what they see of their child when the child's at home but your nursery or your centre, different environment, this child is around peers and it might encourage them to engage in different things. So what the Ofsted inspector is going to be looking at from you is, when you've got this little person here, what is it you're seeing that they like? Beyond there, if this child has attended another centre, so if the child has attended another nursery, let's say, or they've been to a childminder, 
The onus is going to be on you to have spoken to these professionals to find out the experience that the child had there. This is the really exciting bit. You're gonna be able to talk about what the child can do now. And if you think about this little person's learning journey, they could have been in your setting for three, four, five, six months. And in that time, you might have seen a tremendous growth in their abilities and skills. This could be personal skills, it could be social skills, it could be active skills, phys physical skills but it is your opportunity to show how the support you've put in place has developed this little person. I want to talk about the child's interests and this bit's going to be really key as well. What are you focusing on? So with this key child, you know where they're at, you know their journey. What are the opportunities that you're providing for the child now and why are they in place? Now, all of this requires us to look at a much bigger picture when it comes to the changes or reforms that are happening with the EYFS. And the bigger picture is this. Some children are gonna develop tremendously faster than other children. So if you've worked with children long enough, if you've got your own children, you'll notice that there are some milestones that one child will have achieved way before the other. Sometimes adults can get really focused on that. But the reality is children are continually learning and if we focus on comparing children we can actually miss out on some of the magnificent achievements that these individual children are making so we need to understand all children are different and what we want to focus on is going at the child's pace and again if we're focusing on what the child isn't doing i guarantee you you'll be missing out on the awesome things that they are doing so we need to understand there's going to be some children, for example, who when it comes to physical skills, they are miles ahead of some of their peers. In some cases, you can find when children have extreme advances like this, there can be some other areas of the child's learning which really need support. You as the key people are going to be responsible for identifying this. And like I've said before, we want to build on the child's strengths, but we also want to identify any other areas where the child might need a bit more support. So all children have different learning pathways and the depth of learning matters more than moving from one band to the next. In English, what that means is this. We as practitioners can sometimes get really caught up in going through different things the child's achieved. Plan an activity, the child's done the thing we wanted them to do, let's move on to the next. And that can be great, it can be really exciting. We want to make sure children are secure in new skills though. So what that means is we can plan an activity to, let's say, have a toddler balance some building blocks. The child achieved that once or twice in that week, and that's great. You might move on to a next activity the next week. It is really impactful, however, to come back and revisit this opportunity of doing the building blocks again. We want to be confident the child can do this consistently, that they are secure in these skills. Now, when it comes to the assessments that are going to be required of you, generally going to be three types of assessments that are going to be expected. You've got your initial assessments, formative, and then you've got your summative. Your initial assessments are looking at the starting point for the child. So these are the conversations that you've had with parents. Your formative assessments are going to be the ones that you're doing when you're observing the child in your center. This is going to be observing child-led play, it's also going to be looking at opportunities that you've provided for the child as well. Your summative assessments, there are generally two in the EYFS and they are staying. <clears throat> we've got the two year progress check, which usually happens around two years, three months. And then we've got the end of the EYFS report, which is usually done at the end of reception by the child's teacher. All of these are used for Ofsted and for you to get evidence for your children. Now, when it comes to Ofsted, they are not going to be focusing on your formative assessments. They are more going to be focusing on how you as key people know your key children. There is still, however, documentation that Ofsted are going to expect to see when they come to see you. So when they come, they're going to be looking at doing an inspection once every six years. Obviously, if your centre gets an inadequate or requires improvement, Ofsted will inform you of the time frame in which they'll be coming back to reinspect. They're going to look at progress checks for children who are two years old. They're going to be spending time amongst the practitioners. And again, what they are going to be looking at is how well you know your children. Who are your key children? How long have they been here? 
and that sort of list of questions that I went through, starting point, interests of the child, you as the key person need to be aware of those things for each of your key children. So practitioners need to be confident in their knowledge of child development and confidently talk about their key children from starting point to current day. Now, this can be something that's quite big for some people if they've not had a lot of experience in working with children. So I would say if child development is something that you need a bit more support with, we do have three child development courses, one for not to two years old, one for two to three years old, and then one for three to four years old. If it would help you understanding the developmental um, stages of children, do jump onto one of those courses. They're available on the VLA. So they look at the relationships and how you interact, scaffold and support children's learning. The key term in there, in my opinion, is the word relationships. They are gonna be looking at your bond with these children. And do keep in mind, children are tremendously honest. So if there are staff who haven't built relationships with children, these children aren't gonna be able to pretend that they've got a great bond with you just because a new person's turned up. So one of the things that I would really encourage um, going forward, and I would have encouraged anyway, if I'm honest, get to know your little folk. I would say that building these relationships with children is generally the best part of the job. And what Ofsted and the Department for Education are saying now is, we want you as practitioners to focus on that. So you need to know your challenges without having to record these. So this is about understanding, like I said, these are the strengths of the child. These are the areas that we want to develop. You want to be able to discuss the areas for development for the child and what it is you're looking at doing to support them. So you want to be able to tell your key children's story from memory and knowledge of the child as well. Now, again, for some people, literally hearing the word Ofsted is going to make them tremble in their boots. But like I said, I think mindset's really important. You need to consider this is an opportunity for you to talk about these special little people and hopefully the amazing bonds you have with them. So if you consider that as a motivation, I'm hoping it might make it a tiny bit easier for you to have confidence on the day when it turns up. So Ofsted are gonna request documents as well. Some of the things they are gonna request are a list of the current staff and their qualifications, and this includes pediatric first aid training. They're going to ask for the DBS of all staff. They're going to be looking at qualifications, um, any um, checks that have been done on staff and employment arrangements for all staff in the building as well. Suitable persons registers, we talk about those on our designated safeguarding lead course. So if that's something that would interest or benefit you, do look out for that. This information, by the way, as you will know, is all confidential. So it should always be filed away in the manager's office and never on display. So the register showing a list um, of the dates of births of all children and the routine staffing arrangements in your centre. They're going to be looking at a list of children present at the setting during the inspection. If you've got children that are going on a trip that day as well with their um, staff members, you'd obviously need to let the inspector know of that. So all logs that record accidents, exclusions and children taken off roll and incidents of poor behaviour. They're going to be looking at all logs of discrimination, including um, complaints, which are logged as evidence, and any complaints that have been made and any resolutions that you've come to as well. They're going to be looking at fire safety arrangements. So this is looking at how often you have fire drills, which generally should be every six to eight weeks. And a little tip for those of you at your centres, when you're doing fire drills, make sure that you do them on different days of the week and different times of the day. If you're doing your fire drills on a regular basis, but you're doing it on a Friday because there's less staff and you're doing it at lunchtime because that accommodates your centre, great for you, but it doesn't give all your staff the opportunity to practice evacuating the centre. So it says you need a list of any referrals to the local authority and the designated person for safeguarding with a brief overview of them, the resolutions. And then you're also looking at details of all children who have got open social care services and um, support in place for multi-agency teams as well. So these examples of documents that are required are pretty much the same that we've had for quite some time. Now, when it comes to your observations, um, again, your Ofsted inspections, they are not going to be based on key people showing these, but it is not to say that your observations don't matter. You need to have an, a confidence that when you're doing observations that they have value. 
So when you're making observations, what you should be looking at your observations demonstrating is a new skill that the child's learned. We want to be looking at an emerging interest that a child has, a new challenge that the child's facing, something that the child may have struggled with that we're supporting them with. And we're looking at engaging this with the curriculum as well. So when we are looking at children and they are showing us examples of these different things, that's when you want to make observations. We're not just making observations now for the sake of writing something. So do you need to do your observation? Again, a couple of questions to ask yourself. Does it add value? What is this going to give you as a practitioner? It should give you opportunity to be able to mark an achievement or indeed an area that you want to develop so you can look at taking action from there. You need to understand child development. But a key thing for all centres is, for those leaders who are in the centres, you need to identify any gaps in your staff team's knowledge. Now, we've heard of the term cultural capital that's been thrown around for children. And what we're talking about there is identifying any gaps that children have in their learning, tremendously important. I would suggest for leaders, look at the cultural capital of your staff team. Your staff team are going to individually have strengths, things that they are great at. There's potentially gonna be areas that these individual staff might need lots of support with. Again, you as leaders in your center need to know your staff team. What can they do amazingly? What do they need support with? And how are we putting that in place? Now, this is something that's probably going to bring tears to the eyes of some of you, but the EYFS has introduced, or it did introduce language the last time around. So some of the terms that you might recognise are things like curriculum, assessment, pedagogy, but then we've now got impact, implementation and intent as well. Give you a quick task, literally give you like three or four seconds, or you can pause your screen, but I'm going to see if you can match those words up. So the words on the left do link to the words on the right. So for example, the word curriculum is representative or equal to one of the words that are on the other side. So the word curriculum, it could either mean impact, it could mean implementation, it could mean intent. Give yourself a couple of seconds and see if you can pass this one. And just because we're going live, your time's up. If you came up with curriculum meaning intent, so what you want the child to learn, you would have been right. If you looked at pedagogy as implementation, so how we are teaching children, you would have been correct. And if you got the full house and said that assessment was looking at impact, then you would have got a full house. Hope you did well then. Let's have a look at the new development matters. So the Development Matters, it's a non-statutory document. So it is not something that you are expected to be using. However, it is something that is approved by the Department for Education. So it's tremendously beneficial to use it. So guidance to support early years and educational settings in implementing the EYFS statutory framework is what the Development Matters offers. So there's a range of statements that are in this document. They are not to be used as a tick list. They are to assist you in understanding what sort of things we can expect to see from children at different stages. Now, in the current development matters, you'll remember that there's a range of age bandings. So we've got birth to 11 months, eight to 20 months. We've got 16 to 26 months, 22 to 36 months, 30 to 50 months, and then we've got 40 to 60. Those are changing quite significantly. The new age bandings are going to be birth to three, three to four, and then children in reception. Now, if you're anything like me, and don't tell anybody I said this, but when I saw that, I was like, what are Ofsted doing? That's insane. What they're doing is this. They are putting onus on individual members of staff, knowing their individual children. So you might look at the difference and you might be thinking birth to three is far too wide, it's far too big. But the reality is this, since the age banding is so wide now, what you need to do as key people is really know your individual children. You need to be able to observe what it is this child is able to do as an individual and areas you think they need supporting. 
If we look at things like early intervention, supporting children that might have a special educational need or disability, this is gonna be about you understanding, well, I've got this four-year-old child and they are not achieving what it says a four-year-old child should be achieving. New documentation is basically saying, you're the child's key person, what can they do? What is it they need support with? So rather than looking at a checklist, we're focusing on the child. So some of the aims of these new age bandings are to be focused on a child-based curriculum. So rather than a general-based curriculum, we're focusing on individual children. It's to allow adults to get to know children. So rather than adults stressing about what are these different examples, why is my child not doing this? It's getting you to focus more on the child in front of you and meeting their needs. So it's a focus on um, physical development and PSED. So personal, social and emotional development, literally in my opinion, is the foundation for all effective learning from children. In my personal opinion, it's, my, uh, it's the foundation for an effective human in front of you. So if you want your children to be successful and you want to pass your Ofsted inspection, get to know those little folk. It's ensuring that children are secure in their learning. So again, securing their learning is about understanding. When we provide learning opportunities for children and they've maybe achieved what we wanted to see from them, that's great. Let's revisit it. Next steps might mean that we're doing the same activity or providing the same opportunity again, but we're extending it a tiny bit more. It's looking at lots of practice for children. So again, if a child does something once, it doesn't mean they've got the skill. We want them to practice, 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 and then practice some more. So effective pedagogy to engage children. All children have different learning styles. So when we're looking at the characteristics of effective learning, which by the way have stayed the same, when we're looking at these characteristics of children's individual learning, we're expecting key people to understand, this is Billy, he really enjoys being taught this way. This is Sarah over here. She doesn't really like going outside that much. We do it to get her exercise, but she loves a focused activity that's provided um, in the rooms where she gets some support from adults. Who are your little folk and what do they need from you? So I wanted to practice and practice again in different contexts. So if a child had a learning opportunity that's happened in the indoor area, can we take that outside? If a child's had learning opportunities that have been done on a one-to-one -one basis with a key person, can we introduce some of the children into this to make sure that they are now developing social skills as well? So we're looking at suitable next steps for children as well. So again, key person, what am I seeing from this child? Where am I taking what I have just seen from them? Now, all of this is explained in a bit more detail by Julian Grenier, the person that created the New Development Matters and it's available on a little podcast, which is on YouTube. So if you go on YouTube and you search for The New Development Matters with the author, Dr. Julian Grenier, you'll find that lasts for about 20 minutes and you hear the words from the man himself. So let's break it down and have a look at it. Seven areas of learning still say the same. The aspects of the seven areas of learning, however, have changed. So we have the prime areas, which are personal, social and emotional development, communication and language, and then physical development. And they provide a foundation for igniting children's curiosity. So we want children to have secure skills in those three areas so they can engage in other interesting and exciting things. We want children to have enthusiasm for learning. We want them to form relationships and thrive within them as well. So let's have a look at how they've changed. Currently, in personal, social and emotional development, we've got self-confidence and self-awareness, moving, managing feelings and behaviour and making relationships. In September, that will become self-regulation, managing self and building relationships. This is how it's going to look in your development matters. So what you'll see is on the left hand side, you have got examples of what it is you can expect to see from some children. On the right hand side, you've got examples of how practitioners are expected to support this. The area on the right has now replaced what was positive relationships and enabling environments. So in the new development matters, you won't see positive, uh, positive relationships in enabling environments because they've been merged to show this. 
So again, what we're looking at is examples of how you, the practitioner, can support children. Beyond there, there are also observation checkpoints. The observation checkpoints are provided to you to give you examples of what we might see from children at different ages approximately. Again, I really can't stress enough, the aim of this is not to be used as a checklist. It is more so something for staff to refer to so we can look at opportunities for that early intervention if we are noticing that children might be really quite not achieving what we'd expect for their age range. Continuing in the prime areas, we've got communication and language. We've currently got listening and attention, understanding and speaking. That is going to become listening, attention and understanding and speaking. In physical development, we've currently got moving and handling with health and social care. That is going to become gross motor skills and fine motor skills. Those are the prime areas. Let's now take a look at the specific. So the specific is currently literacy, mathematics, understanding of the world and expressive arts and design. These are used for providing a broad and balanced curriculum. Now, one of the things that I would say has changed about the new um, Development Matters and the new EYFS is, we are encouraging practitioners with children under the age of two to use the specific areas as well, so we can really develop those primary skills for all of our little children. Beyond there, we want children to practice development in the prime areas. So again, we want to use these specific areas so children can practice those prime area skills. We want to focus on language and vocabulary and we want prime areas to be strengthened and applied throughout. So in the specific area, we've got literacy. Literacy has reading and writing. In, in September, it's going to be comprehension, word reading and writing. Maths, currently numbers, shape, space and measure, that's going to become numbers and numerical patterns. We've then got understanding of the world, that's currently people and communities, along with the world and technology. That's going to become past, present and future, people, culture and communities and the natural world. And then finally, expressive arts and design, currently exploring and using media and materials and being imaginative, that is going to become creating with materials and then being imaginative and expressive. Now, as I referenced earlier, the overarching principles of the development matters so those positive relationships and those enabling environments, those are still going to exist, but they are going to be formed in a different way in the document. Now, in here, what we're looking at is new things to consider that are in there, we're going to have enabling environments, which is now going to incorporate teaching and supporting children. We're also going to have learning and development as well. So again, you might see some wording that's different, but the main principles which exist in the document you have now, they'll still be provided just in a little bit of a different way. The characteristics of effective learning now become the, characteristic, the characteristics of effective teaching and learning but you'll be happy to know those have stayed the same. So all the same principles that you had in the past, they still exist. What we really wanna focus on for you with your children generally, is we wanna look at children's cognitive development and their social development. How does that transpire for you? With cognitive development, we wanna look at how children think and we want to give them opportunities to think about things as well. We want to look at exploring and figuring things out for themselves. So I think there can be practitioners that have the best aims in heart. They see a child struggling with something and they go and do the thing for the child. Think about a little person trying to put on welly boots and getting a bit muddled there. Sometimes it can just be offering that child a few words of encouragement, which encourages them to try again. We don't want children to be reliant on everybody doing things for them. So we're going to look at the development of knowledge, skills and problem solving. And we're going to look at dispositions which help children to think about and understand the world around them as well. With children's social development, it's linked very closely to their cognitive development and their emotional development as well. So it refers to the process that children learn to be with others. 
I would say with this, as well as children developing the skill to be around other people, we want children to be able to be content with who they are as well. So this is linking back to that diversity, talking about rich values, getting children to understand differences of people, similarities in people. But again, all of that starts with them. If they can embrace and love themselves, we can teach them and support them to um, learn and understand other people as well. So we want them to develop individually and gain skills to communicate with others. And we need to understand that when it comes to learning and share, to, to learning to share, sorry, it is not something that happens when a child is two or three years old. It's actually the direct opposite. Children will learn to share if they're given opportunity to do this. Now, all of this information was a tremendously condensed version of what's changed in the EYFS. If you do have interest in learning more about what's happening in the EYFS and more of a breakdown of the points that I've covered, we do have a course that's available. So if you look on the VLA and search for EYFS, you should find our course available there. It's a live course which will be led by myself or my colleague Catherine, and we'll talk to you in more depth and answer questions about any concerns that you have popping up. Now, I'm sure there's people that have questions regarding things that I've covered so far. If you leave your questions in the comments, and what we'll do is refer to those at the end of this session. What I'm going to do is finish us off with a quote from someone called Katilash Satyarthi. So he was an um, children's rights activist, and he said, every single minute matters, every single child matters, and every single childhood matters. And I'm sure that's something that's the foundation of your practice and that will really empower you to engage with these changes from Ofsted and the UIFS and really empower you to give all your little people the best start in life. Hope this was helpful. Have a great day.